Warning. Extreme scenes of violence and disturbing subject matter. Massive spoilers throughout. S. Craig Zoller, a.k.a. Zar, is a filmmaker, author, and musician, among other things. He has created films starring actors such as Kurt Russell, Tori Kittles, Vince Vaughn, Mel Gibson, Michael Jai White, Jennifer Carpenter, and Don Johnson. Even Scotty Smalls makes an appearance. The three films that he has created have been very well received by critics, but it's probably somewhat likely that you've never heard this man's name before. Why is that? Well, it's not uncommon for a talented and critically acclaimed director to fall under the radar like this, but it could have something to do with the subject matter. After all, Sar is the guy who brought you this. His films feel like they belong to a specific, certain niche group. They're definitely not easy for everyone to digest or sit through, they don't resonate thematically with a lot of people, or they end up dividing a more sensitive audience. But I like my movies with a little bit of indigestion. If you know who S. Craig Zoller is, that makes me very happy, because I love all three of his films, and he has a lot of talent. His films are very reminiscent of old exploitation movies from the 70s in terms of subject matter and provocative levels of violence. They have a certain low-budget charm to them, both in front of and behind the camera, in addition to the realistic depictions of violence. As we dive in, I'm going to discuss some old exploitation films, various subgenres, these three films in detail, and why I love them so much. Here's why S. Craig Zoller is the 21st century's grindhouse auteur. Little bit of backstory on this filmmaking king. Before Sar directed his first feature, he wrote novels, which it seems he still does, performed as a metal musician, wrote 40 plus original screenplays, including an obscure body horror screenplay, which is the only one that was produced, and acted as cinematographer for various short films. I'm not much of a reader, admittedly, but I at least looked up the summaries for his novels, and he definitely favors certain themes and subjects. His first two novels revolve around the Old West and fit this setting into thriller and horror genres, much like his film Bone Tomahawk. A few of his other novels touch on the crime thriller genre, similar to Brawl in Cell Block 99 and Dragged Across Concrete, planting the thematic seeds early on. Just like his films, many of his novels have amazing reviews, which solidifies Sar as a talented writer. It seems as though a lot of his early resume added lots of hats to his filmmaking repertoire, like between his time as cinematographer, interest in music, and skills as a writer, Sar is in the perfect position to create evocative, lurid visions for his cinematic endeavors. Because when you go to make a film and you have a director who knows exactly what they want, exactly what they need for every single shot down to the T, it's easy to plan it. This is what makes him an auteur. His visions and control over the film liken him to the author of the film. For all three of his films, he has acted as writer, director, and composer in some capacity. This makes it ever more important to discuss the topic of exploitation films, my perceived basis for his filmmaking prowess. In a nutshell, exploitation films are movies containing suggestive themes such as excessive violence, gore, mayhem, rebellion, explicit sexual content, drug use, and or the bizarre, which are used to provoke the audience. These are common themes within these types of films, and there are an insane amount of subgenres that explore, let's say, specific situations and stylings. Sar uses a few exploitation subgenres over the course of his short filmography, mainly with multiple subgenres within one film. Among the most common Sar subgenres are R and Revenge, Nazi exploitation, black exploitation, cannibal films, and action exploitation. These terms will all make sense, I promise. But in order for that to happen, we must start with his first film. Bone Tomahawk is awesome. It's a lost race, cannibal, revenge, western, with great acting, style, substance, humor, and depth. Although some of the interpersonal conflict may get old, over the film's 2 hour and 12 minute runtime, there is a fantastic build up to the graphic and disturbing conclusion. Two idiots, Buddy and Purvis, 
disturb an evident burial site belonging to a lost race of cannibalistic troglodytes who attack and kill Buddy. Thereafter, the surviving idiot seeks refuge in a local town. The freakish tribe then ransacks the town in search of purpose, leading to the kidnapping of many townspeople which sparks Sheriff Hunt, old-timer Deputy Chicory, gunslinger John Bruder, and the temporarily injured Arthur O'Dwyer to travel and find those kidnapped. En route, they encounter various obstacles including the worsening of Arthur's leg wound, the losing of their horses, an ambush by raiders, and each other. Upon finding the cannibals, there is an exceptionally brutal ending where a few natives and rescue party members die with the townspeople coming out victorious. Already there are some obvious exploitation genres including cannibal films and even a play on R and Revenge. In addition, there is no shortage of excessive violence, gore, mayhem, one sex scene for some reason, and definitely the bizarre. The bizarre is a frequent theme among Zar's films and I am here for it. The R and Revenge subgenre is usually referencing the awful act itself and the victim getting revenge on the monster who tormented them. In the case of this film, the act is the destruction of their town by the troglodytes and the kidnapping of the townsfolk, and the revenge is the physical revenge. I really appreciate how these themes meld together and build upon each other as we get to the sensationalized ending. You can really tell that Saar had so much passion while making this film, and the actors, namely veteran star Kurt Russell, think he handled the project very well for a first-time director, and I agree. Not only is the script taut, but the direction's superb as well. He feels uncompromising in his vision, and I think that's how it should be. He's an artist. Let him make his art. In particular, this piece of art, Bone Tomahawk, is definitely Saar improving on other Western situations he's seen in other films that he perhaps didn't like. The film just feels like it has complexities to it, which makes a simple revenge story so much more interesting. I really wish they were given a higher budget, because there is cut content that didn't make it into the film due to budget constraints, and I really want to see what that's all about. Overall, this is an exploitation film of multiple subgenres with added complexity and depth, which definitely deals with divisive themes. As previously mentioned, Saar uses a few subgenres with some interesting names, Nazi exploitation being one, which traditionally includes films where Nazis commit sex crimes against people in their camps. Yeah, the 70s were weird. There is a hot take on the genre within the next film, Brawl in Cell Block 99. Desperate and freshly jobless, Bradley Thomas becomes a drug mule for his friend Gil, who has just partnered with a drug lord named Eleazar. With Bradley's wife being pregnant and their lives filled with uncertainty, he accepts the job with Eleazar's men despite his distrust. The job ends up being a police trap, which results in Eleazar's men open firing on the cops, Bradley intervening to save the officer's lives, and him being sentenced to a medium security prison for seven years. Due to the job going awry, Bradley's wife is kidnapped with the threat of the unborn child's limbs being severed while still in the womb, leaving the child to live and be born armless and legless. Jesus Christ! That is unless Bradley kills a prisoner located in a different but maximum security prison. Bradley is forced to use violence, which he is against, to get sent to the maximum security prison where he realizes it was all a trap set up by Ali Azar, who is now in jail, along with Bradley. Using his wits and strength, Bradley bests the Nazi-ish guards, Eleazar and his henchmen, and the warden, forces his wife to be released from captivity, and secures a decent future for his wife and unborn child via Gil. All of this at the cost of Bradley's life at the hands of the warden. As you can see, the themes from Brawl are a bit more social in nature as compared to Tomahawk. They are more relatable, yet there's still some bizarre, cruel, and unusual stuff to be found. The film explores themes of chance, choices, ethics, societal perception, and wealth disparity, in addition to the exploitative themes such as excessive violence, gore, and the genres of Nazi exploitation and Aryan revenge. As previously mentioned, this is a hot take on the Nazi exploitation genre. Rather than the whole film being centered around a Nazi camp, the maximum security prison Bradley eventually gets sent to midway through the film is that camp. The guards' outfits are even similar to that of Nazi Gestapo. Rather than using sexual crimes against prisoners, the guards use cruel punishments and methods of torture using an electric shock belt on prisoners, depriving them of sunlight, and forcing them to live in cells with broken glass on the floor. It's all sickening to think about. Um, I'm just gonna add this in, uh, but Saar also wrote a sequel to Puppet Master. Yeah, those films. It came out in 2018, the same year that Dragged Across Concrete came out, and it was actually relatively well received by critics, for the most part. 
This guy creates gold, or at least silver, out of anything. The reason I bring it up is because the plot of the Puppet Master sequel revolves around a Nazi war criminal puppet. <laughs> Sar explores these exploitative themes frequently and is constantly perfecting them. The violence. My god, the violence. It is so well done, and it's all mainly done practically, without any CG. I think there's only one scene I can think of that even looks like it used CG a little bit. The actors rehearsed all of their fight scenes together without stunt doubles, which heavily adds to the realism being portrayed in the film. Rather than using quick cuts and close-ups, a lot of, if not all, of the action and violence displayed is in wide shots, in undisturbed takes, so everything can be seen and absorbed. Um, some of it does look cheesy, with the fake bodies and stuff like that, but you can't deny that it's absolutely visceral. I think Brawl might be my favorite of the three. I, I watched the films in order, starting with Bone Tomahawk, which made Brawl the second film I saw of SARS. Uh, one night I decided to watch Bone Tomahawk and Brawl as a double feature, and they just both amazed me. Vince Vaughn in Brawl plays such a great character. This is easily one of my favorite performances of his. I mean, not that there's a huge line of choices. He brought Bradley Thomas to life, as did all of the other actors. So, Brawl is 2 hours and 12 minutes, which is the same length as Tomahawk, so just keep in mind that every single one of his films is over 2 hours long. Although, I do think that every film is justified in its respective length. Dragged Across Concrete has my favorite title of his films. The title just conjures up this horrifying image of somebody's nails peeling back as they're dragged across some rough-ass concrete. There's even a scene from Brawl where some dude's face is dragged across concrete. Yuck as fuck. Coming in at 2 hours and 39 minutes, this film can be a lot to handle. Let's see. Two strong-armed police officers, Brett and Anthony, are suspended after a video surfaces of them committing police brutality. For their own reasons, Brett and Anthony descended to the criminal underground to make money for their families. Meanwhile, Henry, a criminal whose mother has returned to prostitution and whose brother is handicapped, works with his friend Biscuit to act as getaway drivers for a criminal named Vogelman. Brett and Anthony use connections to track down Vogelman, who they plan on robbing after an upcoming heist. After a violent encounter at the bank during the heist, Vogelman and his crew escape while Henry notices Brett and Anthony following behind. Neglecting to tell Vogelman this, Henry brings the crew to a location where they are ambushed by the detectives, and unfortunately, Biscuit is killed. After an intense shootout involving guns and tear gas, Anthony is killed, as are Vogelman and his henchmen, with only Brett and Henry remaining. Not trusting each other, the two agree to split the hall from the heist, but Brett attempts to shoot Henry, leading to Brett dying instead at the hands of Henry. Henry assumingly gives his friend Biscuit and the detectives a proper burial. He then gives Brett's wife her share of the bullion and lives in a mansion with his mother and brother. Jeez, this one's just so dense and in-depth that I struggle cutting a lot out of the summary. There are a lot of intricacies to the heist that make for a very interesting and intriguing watch. The film, of course, has the trademark Zoller humor and witty dialogue in addition to those pesky exploitative themes. Dragged Across Concrete introduces a subgenre I mentioned a little bit earlier, black exploitation. Within the past 26 years, there have actually been a number of black exploitation films made, including the Shaft remake, Black Dynamite, Jackie Brown, Pootie Tang, and The Harder They Fall, to name a few. Although the whole film isn't black exploitation, I mean, I guess that could be argued, but the genre is present and in focus enough. What's commonly seen in black exploitation films that are also present in Dragged Across Concrete are locations set in low-income urban areas, the use of violence and such to provoke the audience, funk and soul jazz incorporated into the soundtrack, and black protagonists overcoming symbols of white oppression. The characters Biscuit and Henry are protagonists painted as struggling low-income people that need to help their families. Their only way of doing so is to overcome the system that they're trapped in, get their money, and get out while they can before crime eats up their lives. All with a kick-ass soundtrack, broken bones, blood, and gore. In addition to the film being partially black exploitation, it is also action exploitation, but less so due to the lack of parody, comedy. I think these exploitation subgenres are just jumping off points for substance, not the entire encapsulation of SARS films. So action exploitation films are basically buddy cop movies with cheesy action and lowbrow humor. I mean, to be honest, this one is a bit of a stretch. 
The two detectives have rapport and are funny, and they definitely give off a macho vibe due to their brutal tactics, but overall this film is not a comedy. There's a castration scene. I mean, you could find that funny, I guess. It may seem like I'm trying to pigeonhole this guy into my own conceived notions about his film's subject matter. There are directors that cover topics like these who are not exploitation directors. Do I think that S. Craig Zoller is exclusively an exploitation film director? Hell no. He's just a nuanced director adding life, intelligence, and complexity to these low-budget, chintzy-type genres. He's inspired by the heart and soul of these bizarre video nasties. He's a talented filmmaker with a great mind and eye for this kind of art. I can't wait to see what he does next because so far I have been blown away. Hit my line next time you make a movie, bro. I want an advanced screening, please. Thank you for watching and see ya.